Well, everybody, we're going to get started with our program here. Thank you, uh, Marriott. Thank you, Ms. Staff. That was a wonderful lunch. Um, so, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today, Mr. Ty Oswalt. Ty is an architect who has uh, the pleasure of leading Gensler's global aviation practice. He's a longtime resident of Georgetown. Ty is currently based in Pittsburgh, where he's working on a project, and he yearns to be back in D.C. On a day-to-day -day basis, we're happy we could bring you back. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, he works with the best aviation designers in the world, working on projects at JFK, New York, Toronto, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, San Diego, San Francisco, and Chicago. Ty is a graduate of Virginia Tech. There we have a few of those with us and has been recognized by Airport News and by ENR, both with their 40 under 40 recognition. He teaches at Virginia Tech, Ohio State, and at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. Ty is an Eero Serenin geek. We have a few of those here too, And thrilled to be here today. So Ty, welcome. Thank you for being here. All right, let's see if I can. Oh. Trying to pander to you, everyone. This is the Gensler team up front. I'm trying to pander to them. <laughs> Very nice. I'm not, not too shy about doing that. So, first of all, thanks for having me. A uh, great opportunity to be back. I, I spoke here, and we were trying to figure out which year. What I think it was about two years ago. Uh, how many people heard that? And was it riveting? Yes. Tell your kids about it. It was, it was great. But thanks for having me back. Obviously, did not say anything too offensive that got me on the blacklist. So here we are again. Um, so obviously, a lot has changed in in a couple of years. And you know, when we were thinking about when when we talked at that point, we were right in the middle of COVID, and our world prior to COVID on the aviation front was was rapidly changing we were seeing a huge trajectory in passenger traffic, and a lot of our airports were facing the scene. So I might be the only person in the room who can say, you know, COVID actually did some good things. Uh, from an airport pers design perspective, it made us kind of tap the brakes a little bit and think about what do we really want to do? And could we take an opportunity to re-envision what we as an industry do? And that's, that's really what we're going to talk about today is coming out of post-COVID, what are the next opportunities that, that I see from a design perspective, and how might that ultimately impact what we've got at Dulles? Because I think, like we said, Eric Saren and Geek, uh, Dulles, you know, when people ask me what my favorite airport is, it's always Dulles. I think Saren did a lot of just really revolutionary things at the original Dulles, and how do we restore the airport to that luster that it was before? So, with that, we're going to talk a little bit about trends. We're going to talk a little bit about what I'm calling the gateway and how do we make Dulles the preferred gateway for every international traveler coming in. Talk a little bit about the concept of dwell and finish on the idea of what should we really be focusing on is the passenger that's arriving in Dulles and how do we cater to that passenger type going forward. So, start with terminal design. Um, you know, if you go to a cocktail party and you find an architect and you ask them what they do, and I hear this a lot, and people will say, well, you design airport terminals, you must be incredibly technical in all the different things that go into it. It's really not. That's the, the worst idea ever because all we're simply doing is getting people from point A to point B. The airport journey is somewhere in between, and the journey needs to somehow represent both of the sides, A and B and not really preference one, but you need to make it great. Uh, good, I said I would never use the phrase, make it great again, but there we go. Uh, so, and that's really what we want to talk about, is how do we get the experience at Dulles in between A and B to be great? So, just a, a few kind of context setters first. So, the stats are a little bit old, so they're coming, I didn't want to use last year's stats, so I went back to pre-pandemic. So 7.2 billion people took an aircraft flight uh, in 2019. That's a, think about that. That's every person on the planet got onto a, a flight. Now, some of us um, use more than our quota, but inevitably that's a lot of people going through our airports. Of those passengers, think about the cities that they come from. Our cities are getting bigger. Now we know that the pandemic did kind of shift that, 
and people started migrating outside of the big cities and trying to find a different standard of living. But for the most part, people are not coming back to cities and dwelling again. So when you think about what those things mean, I, I put a stat up for Atlanta. Atlanta's going to have 100 million passengers again. They were on track to get hit 100 million. Uh, I think the last tally I saw, they were really, really close getting to 100 million. And the question is, does that airport become sustainable at 100 million, or is, is it too big at that point? If you look at passengers and the amount of distance that they're flying, at 1,500 miles per trip, what that's starting to tell me is that the smaller aircraft that we've been used to flying in are going to get bigger. So you have bigger airports, you've got more passengers going through them on longer journeys. So what does that really mean is that we're getting bigger, but is bigger really better? Can we figure out a way to make our airports somewhat more tailored to what they need to be? So we started looking a lot at what do the mid-sized airports do well? And I'm not a huge fan of, of stats and rankings because they, you can fudge them in a lot of different ways. But when you look at the top 50 airports in, in the world, anybody have any, any idea where the first U.S. airport comes in at? 28, uh, and that's, that's a little bit hard to fathom, but and a lot of the airports that are kind of in, the, in that mid-tier are, are in that kind of 20 to 30 range are smaller airports, and what makes them so good is that they're easy to use. When you look at a place like Cincinnati, which is a lot of times in those rankings, you look at a place like Lexington. What makes them good is that they're easy to navigate. They figured out a way to not be the diagram on the left, which is a little bit what we get at JFK or somewhere like that, where it's really convoluted to get around. They streamlined. Uh, you know, when this is a project that that I worked on uh, many years ago in Portland, Maine, and we s went to the first community meeting because we, we were told that there there needed to be community involvement in it, and it was surprising how angry the people were that we were actually going to touch their airport. And it was all because this one guy stood up and said, I know I can get from my house through security in seven minutes. He's like, if I have to do it in nine minutes, I'm pissed. And, and it was that kind of level of thinking. He had a familiarity. He knew how to get through the airport. So, even though we're getting bigger, we can't screw with that guy's seven minute duration. So what made the airport friendly? It was really about predictability. So we did a, a whole survey for a lot of airports in the mid-sized families to kind of see what made them great. And it was all about customer service. Starting to think about it more about a hospitality lens where you're treating people like hotel guests instead of passengers. And some of the airlines are getting that. Some some are not. Uh, some of our airport authorities are getting it. MWA is great. And I'm pandering to Richard now. Uh, but <laughs> but it, I think you, you have to have a mindset about customer experience and customer service to get to that point where you're, you're really committed to doing what's best. So if we think about what we do for Dallas, is how we get from A to B but simplify the journey. So I'll take a, a little bit of a step back. This is a uh, a few things, and it's almost like Nostradamus, that prior to COVID was starting to think about you know, what are technologies that we could use to make the building smaller. And this was the exact slide, I swear to God. Uh, this, I used this prior to COVID and he said, this is the future that's coming out, but not identifying what a horizon might be. Self-drop baggage systems where you're in control of your baggage and you don't have an agent. But the idea of having your boarding pass on your cell phone to be able to do that seemed you know, foreign at the time. The idea of pre-cleared security, almost a pre-check, but then you could do it like Disney, <coughs> where you could order a time slot to get there. These seem like you know, these wild, crazy ideas prior to the pandemic. Lo and behold, the pandemic exacerbated these and advanced these technologies to the point, not necessarily because uh, we wanted to reduce the footprint of our buildings, but because these became necessities in terms of how we dealt with people. So, great for us, we kind of saw the future coming. Uh, so now's a good chance to think about what is the next audacious level of things that we start to think about. So, for us, it's really looking at biometric screening. Uh, meaning, when you talk to TSA, they're not necessarily screening 
they are screening your bags, they're screening for that individual contraband, but they're more worried about screening you. They have a profile of who you are when you're going through, and they can kind of make a pretty good determination on who's suspect. So, and that's all in your DNA. So why do we even have screening devices anymore if the determination's already been made by PSA prior to you showing up? So that's one. Uh, two is direct to aircraft boarding, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to some slides on Dulles, but the idea that your vehicle can screen you and you can be delivered directly to your gate is another idea I think we'll start to see more in the future. And then comes a solve away from marketplace and uh, uh, we'll figure out how to make your concessions work. <laughs> uh, this one is, is driverless. You know, I, I live in Pittsburgh, which is kind of the epicenter for driverless vehicles, and it, it's it's a little spooky to be walking on the street and you see cars zooming by that don't have drivers in them. But that is going to be the technology going forward. So we need to embrace it now and see how that can help us. So the question is, can Dulles both simultaneously grow in capacity grow in terms of what it does and shrink at the same time. So they quickly talk about four trends that we globally see from working with other aviation clients. And these are kind of the foundation for, for what I see going forward. Uh, first one's connected. So uh, this, is, this is a game changer. Everyone knows that this is the Dulles uh, connection to Metro. And I, I think it, uh, you can probably speak better to it than I can, but to me, this starts to really connect the airport back to the region and make it not just for passengers, but we were talking at lunch a little bit about workers. And when a worker can use mass transit to get to their job, uh, that's a game changer. I would argue that we can take it one step further for the passenger. And I don't know, has anyone been to Heathrow or Toronto Pearson? And both of those have dedicated programs from an airport that's like clockwork every 25 minutes there's a 15 minute train to get you to city center. Can we start to figure out how to do that uh, with the metro, working really with Metro, figure out if we can get express trains. I think the other thing that we're gonna to start to see, and you can thankfully see it above this crazy hypothetical airport in the Middle East that we're doing, but you've got train lines coming in, these are all high, high speed lines, but then you've got drones above. So how do you connect both land and air in different transit opportunities coming soon. So, uh, second principle is healthy. Uh, although I don't look like it, I, I, the pandemic really did help me focus on my health a little bit. And I think a lot of people started thinking about making different choices about what they do. And, you know, that, that's great at a home lifestyle, but then more globally, uh, how does that start to manifest itself in airports? And a couple of things that we've, we've done in the past were yoga rooms, have outdoor spaces, and those were all, those are great amenities for the passenger, but we're trying to think about what's the next step in that. Could you design a concourse around an idea of a garden? Meaning that you start with kind of an open void, that, that big ring in the center, and actually force everyone to walk through that. Make that not off to the side and not a, a nice to have or a, a premium lounge offering, but make that part of the airport journey that people go outside or have the opportunity to go outside to really think about it. And the way that we're starting to talk about this with our client is making lungs in a building. And you can actually use that green to kind of soak up some of the, the toxins, some of the aircraft fuel vapors that are coming in to really redistribute that and make a different kind of experience. So beyond necessarily thinking about personal health, can we start to think about building health? I think there is also a new awareness about you know, what do our buildings do and what's the contribution to the planet and the, the bad things that building buildings contribute about 49% of the, the elements that are contributing to global warming. So can we design buildings that are better and smarter? So it's a project that this team's working on right now at JFK. And we're doing two things that, you know, it's surprising to me when I talk about them because they just seem so darn stupid to think about why doesn't everyone do these? And really, we, we've talked a lot about internally, an airport is a skyscraper that then it just <coughs> kicked over. So you've got a massive amount of roof area on a building. 
why doesn't every airport take the opportunity to put photovoltaic cells on, on their airport? This, because of the size of this, this is T1 at JFK, we're able to essentially power the building on battery power in the event of an emergency for up to three days with no outside. So we can go off the grid if we want to. Second thing is, it's, Dulles is a little bit of the one anomaly in terms of some airports that we see. A lot of airports, for better or for worse, are located along bodies of water. I think when everyone saw Superstorm Stan, Super Storm Sandy come through and those images of LaGuardia being flooded, uh, it's a head scratch. Like, well, that's not real smart to put the basement of your airport at the floodplain. So what this team did is we actually <laughs> took the entire building and lifted it up above the 100-year floodplain. Uh, real simple move. We have to add a few more stairs to get down in certain areas, but it seemed like common sense. Why can't most airports do the common stuff a little bit better? The last uh, point is appropriate. Uh, we, we actually were talking, this is Pittsburgh International, uh, where I'm living now and working on this project. And it, we were talking a bunch about what Pittsburgh used to be and kind of the, and, and when it was a U.S. Air Hub, you know, I don't know if ever, anyone's flown through Pittsburgh, but it's a, it's a head house building, then you take a train out, and it's got an X-shaped concourse. That was great for U.S. Air because they were the dominant carrier and it, that X worked really well. But when U.S. Air decided to pack up and leave, the airport became a relic. It was, it was a dinosaur that was far too big for what it was. So what this project is doing is actually keeping the X in place and building a new terminal up in the crotch of Good technical term. <laughs> <laughs> That's a memorable location. There you go. <laughs> meet, meet me in the crotch. <laughs> so, so essentially, what we're doing is right-sizing the airport and, and making it fit for purpose. There is no no need for Pittsburgh to be 100 gates anymore. Pittsburgh needs to be somewhere around 30 or 40 gates. But why can't you use the real estate that you've got? in a much better way, making it appropriate for its purpose. All right, so that was, those are the big trends that we're seeing. I'm sure there's hundreds of others, but those are the four that I've kept. So that's what we want. So the next one is, is gateway. Um, every airport that we talk to is interested in the international market. It's more revenue, it's, it, well, it, it starts and ends with revenue. Let's just leave it at that. Um, so, how do you compete against all these airports coming into the U.S.? Because they're all looking for the same passenger. How do you make it so that Dulles is the gateway of choice? And so, you look. The other thing with these is each one of these is doing a massive capital program right now. They're investing billions to be able to lure this particular passenger segment back into them. The one. I'm going to go back just so that we take that away. You'll notice all of them are really major U.S. cities, except for that one up there on the north, Toronto. So we've been working with Toronto for a while, and I, I still remember that the first discussion we had with them, we set up a, a meeting with all their executive team. Went into the room, and we, we always start with, you know, what are you trying to achieve? What are your goals? Fast forward seven years after this building's open, what do you, what do you want the press release to say? And their CEO stood up and said, we want to be the number one U.S. airport in the world. Wow. And, right. and so <laughs> you pause on that and you say, well, what does that mean? In reality, well, what it means is that they've seen, and this is a little bit pre-COVID before all this expansion started, but they saw an opportunity that the U.S. was not fully committed to international rivals. They could make a better traveler experience for someone coming from Germany who needed to get to Omaha. That it was a much better journey going through Toronto, the processing in Toronto, pre-clearing in Toronto so that you arrive at, at Des Moines and you're domestic. That was much better than going through Miami or JFK or anywhere else because they control their environment and they had the will to do that. And Again, it's, it was a little hard to understand as an American going up there and 
having the Canadians tell us how bad it were was eye opening, but it is what it is. So beware the Canadians are coming. Um, how they were really going to do it was thinking about modes of, of passenger experience. And when we think about modes, it's really a mindset of what is a passenger doing at any one moment in time. The first thing that they do, you can't read it because I drew it way too small, but it's task mode. And a task in an airport is check-in, it's dropping your bag, going through security or on the inbound side coming through immigration or, or customs. And those are the things that as a passenger you don't have control over. But those are the things that you remember and that you can't really enjoy your airport journey until you get through those things. And, uh, anytime I go through security, I now I can take a breath, and then I, now I can spend money, or I can do whatever I want. Now my time is mine again. Well, what Canadians figured out is how to make task mode seamless. So they're using biometrics, they're using any trick in the book that they can. As soon as you land, you're starting your process to get through Immigration and Customs immediately so that they're giving you more of your time back so you can enjoy just sitting in the lounge or doing whatever you do. So task mode, task mode, task mode. That's all, that's all we've got. All right, so that's, that's kind of the gateway. The next discussion point is wealth. Right, we, we have a, a designer who's usually with us. Uh, we can't be here today, but he kind of coined this phrase, so I'll right, say so it's not here, I play the mind. <laughs> this idea of wealth. It used to be that you know people would go to an airport and they would sit at the gate. And a lot of people still do that today. And that gate area is probably about as wide as this as this room, and people are just sitting waiting for their aircraft to come. Then they board and off they go. Well, I think that COVID has taught us the value of our own personal time. And people are expecting more. They're expecting different things, whether that's the Amazon factor of you know, personalization and get what you want, or whether that's just natural human evolution. We want more from, from our gate. So this idea that now it's not just about sitting, it's about dwelling and being part of different environments that you could have. So this is, I think I presented this last time, two years ago, but it still feels fresh. So we're going to quickly go through it again. Uh, this is the a hypothetical project that Charles, who's the designer, and I worked on during COVID. And the Washingtonian Magazine asked design firms to reimagine what a DC icon might be. So we picked Dulles and kind of said, you know, if you had no rules, what would you do with Dulles and make it different or make it better? So we started with looking back at what Dulles was. Again, this goes back to my era of Saren and upbringing of, Saren was so ahead of his time because what the problem that Dulles, he was trying to solve with Dulles, he had just finished TWA. And TWA was, you know, everyone knows the TWA hotel, but it's so form driven and you kind of come through and then you get into little hold rooms and he could kind of see that aircraft were getting bigger and the distance that someone had to walk from their car to get to that end was really long. And so he started thinking about, well, why would, why would you design something like that? What if you design an airport like Dulles that you come through, you're dropped at the curb, and then it's less than it's 500 steps to get from there to your gate or to the mobile lounge, and then that would take you directly to your aircraft. So what Charles and I started thinking about was, could we recreate that? Could we do something in a much newer version of that to restore the history to that? So, what we were proposing was actually, you can see the historic building, and, and then taking over the short-term parking and building a small, little building there. And that building would be, thinking back to task mode, that building would be your check-in, your security, and your bag claim. So that, take care of all those functions that people inherently want to get through as quickly as possible. Get them out of the main building. The main building would then become just clear everything out on both levels. So now you've got a two level building that everyone who's waiting for their flight would stay in that main building. And that's really what Sarah was trying to do from the beginning anyway, was to keep people in the building for as long as possible until it was time for them to go to their flight. So we started thinking about that whole idea. This is, again, this is artist's interpretation of what it 
could look like because you have the you have the metro that's coming here. You see, you've got a green park. It's under here, so theoretically, people coming off the metro would go down underground. This could be sky lit. And then you would come up into this new processor building. They have, would have check-in, security, and all the functions that you want to get through as quickly as possible. Or if you had your boarding pass already on your phone, which everyone does now, if you didn't have to check a bag, we kept the roadway up here in front of this building. If you could be screened by your Uber on the way in, you could arrive directly at the front door of, of that building, show your boarding pass, show that you've been screened, and go right into the gate mount. Just wait there. So now you've bypassed that building altogether. So again, it's it's a harebrained idea, and that, that's when I'll blame Charles for that. <laughs> but it, it's an idea about what the future could be. So the last concept is this idea of arrival. I, I, this is the part where I will start to diverge a little bit from Saren. When you think about what the what the Great Room was, was a statement about leaving Washington, D.C. It, was it was an icon that does really represent D.C. well, but at the end of the day, it was about passengers coming to that aircraft, or coming to that building to go through it, and they've already been to D.C. or they're a resident of D.C. and they're leaving. We take a slightly different idea about that and talk about that in a second. So a lot of our clients are now asking for what they're calling sense of place. And as an architect first, it kind of makes me nauseous to think about that because it, a lot of our clients uh, think about recreating elements of the city at their airport and it becomes a Disney version of what they're doing. So the analogy I would give is we're not gonna build a mini Washington Monument, a mini Capitol inside of this building because that, although that is synonymous with DC, it doesn't represent what the spirit of Dallas is all about. So to me, go to this one first, it's, a, it's more about creating a place of sense. Can we create something that is so memorably easy to use that a passenger, does, does everyone remember what the best airport, the smoothest journey they've ever been through? I, I can tell you right now, it's, for me it's Munich, Airport, and I'll always, and I, I couldn't tell you for the life of me what that airport looked like, other than I was off my plane through immigration in six minutes, and it was so easy to use. And I'll fly through Munich any day of the week because of that. Couldn't tell you what it looks like, couldn't tell you anything about it, but I just remember that feeling that I got going through it. To us, place is more about something like this. So. We started working with Syracuse, and they asked us to do, this was a, essentially to create a new entrance to the terminal. And so we sat down again with them for their, their first visioning session. We asked the airport staff, you know, what, give us a word, how would you describe your airport? And I'll, I'll never forget, the one, the CEO stood up and said, morbid, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's just like, well, this isn't gonna be easy. <laughs> so, we started thinking about, you know, okay, so obviously it's, it doesn't have a positive energy to it. We took a step back and started looking at who's actually flying into and out of the airport. When you look at the catchment area for that airport, there were 31 universities who were, all those students were coming and going through this airport and made up a big percentage of their population that was using the airport. So the question became, how do you create an airport that is more inclined to be an academic campus or more an academic center than <laughs> necessarily a passenger throughput airport. So we started designing and showing them sketches about could we design an airport that represents a campus quad? Could there be, you know, can you go to, so we went to Syracuse University and just watch people, not stalking, but we, we did just kind of watch people a little bit and see how they use the public spaces and it was amazing how people in Syracuse would just sit on the steps of different buildings and that's where they would study or they they would do work here or just be with friends so the steps became somewhat synonymous with what our design solution ultimately was could we create new steps in the airport so that's what we did so for me and uh, starting to think about the arrival sequence, and this is how it pertains to Dulles. Can we make 
three three elements. One, make it DC centric and do that through a welcome process. Number two, make the process and all the technology really hum, much like the Canadians are doing. How do we get to that? And lastly, how do we connect beyond what we've got right now? So I'm gonna reference JFK a little bit. So this is um, just a montage of the imagery, but what's more important, so maybe we'll do two avatars of uh, you know, passengers arriving. So we started to describe this to the director of the Port Authority to help him understand what we were talking about. So imagine that you are, you're from Italy, you've never been to the US before, and you're gonna fly into JFK, and just that whole notion of flying into JFK makes you a little bit uneasy. You don't speak the language well, and you know it's gonna be a nightmare getting through the customs. So how could we start to make that passenger feel a little bit more comfortable along the way? So this is the sterile corridor. You've just arrived off your aircraft. You come up a level, and now you're walking in. So could we create, and these are just, these are simply flat panel TVs that have a clear background there. But we've got the technology that can look at your phone, understand what your native language is, so that when I walk by it, this, this lady would say, hey, in English. And maybe she's giving me information as I go. But if I'm coming in from China, and maybe this is a, the language is Chinese, and maybe it's audible softly that they're giving me clues as to what my next step is. Could they somehow start to direct me in go a level above just signage that says, go this way. So that's that's Avatar 1, and that would be a great welcome. Imagine if that happened in DC. Secondly, so the second Avatar would be, let's say you're coming in from France, you've been to the US before, and you've flown in through Miami, and the expectation that when you go through Miami, you come off your aircraft, you go into a Sarapore, you go down to the basement of a building, and you're with, it feels like the world is with you in that one room. And that's your experience of arriving in the US. So what could we do that's different? So now at JFK, what if we took that immigration hall out of the basement, we actually put it on the roof of the building? And what if we had 20 <coughs> foot tall glazing systems that allow natural light into that? So now I get off my aircraft, I come into the sterile quarter, I stay high, and I'm turning the corner, and I'm expecting that I'm gonna go down an escalator to the bowels of the building, but really what I'm doing is I'm going to stay high and I get into this light-filled CBP hall. And it's, it's your whole mindset is different about how you've arrived in the U.S. That could be the opportunity at Dulles that we've got. The next thing is to think about task-free and how do, we, how do we do that? Well, sterile corridors by their nature are, are long tubes. Uh, there is technology in place now that can scan you as you're walking long distances. So why not use the sterile corridor as your immigration process? So we're, we're talking with CBP about is there a way that we can screen passengers coming in, identify the threats, have them kind of divert and go into a, a smaller hall, but for the 80, 90% of the people who are cleared, and CBP knows this coming in, why couldn't they just keep walking? Why does your process for arriving is an immigrant actually have to stop, just keep going through. So that's that's the, the technology aspect that we need. The last thing is thinking about how we connect beyond the, the airport. So I have a I have a theory and that airports that want to be a great international hub and a domestic or a great international gateway and a domestic hub have a hard time doing both simultaneously. It, it's a tough, tough proposition because you, you kind of have to cater to one or the other and inevitably one of them suffers. So what if Dulles would really just focus on building the biggest and best international gateway that we could get? And what if Reagan became the domestic connector hub? So then the question becomes, how do you get passengers <clears throat> so what we're working on now with a company in, in Asia is looking at drone technology. They're called EV poles, uh, vertical lift uh, aircraft, that essentially helicopters that go up. But what if that aircraft, so I arrived domestic, or I'm sorry, I arrived internationally 
I have processed through customs immigration and I, I need to get to Des Moines. What if I could get on one of these drone aircraft that would fly me directly over to Reagan? What if that aircraft didn't necessarily need to drop me at the front door of Reagan, but it could screen me on my way? Could it land right beside my gate and drop me? And then I go directly from that vehicle right up to my aircraft and off I go. And, and that, to me, would be a different kind of journey. That makes Dulles much more efficient, makes Dulles great, and then it starts to figure out how do you really make it an appropriate terminal design for what it does. Well, how do you deal with <clears throat> gate competition, ownership? I mean, Reagan's extremely limited. LaGuardia is extremely limited. I mean, those are domestic nightmares, both of them, as far as capacity goes for commercial domestic airlines. How, how do you, who do you involve in that decision? Because, I don't know, it's kind of a hard thing. I'm not going to claim to have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do think, so uh, there's a gentleman here from, from Leesburg that, was talking, you know, that, that, that we were talking earlier. I, my, my background was a little bit from from New York and seeing how Stewart Airport in Westchester has grown as a reliever airport. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, the, there's, it's a lot simpler to do a domestic operation. In my mind, I, Richard May thinks I'm full of crap, but, but it could, I think you could find opportunities for, for that type of short haul flight. Maybe it's not Reagan, maybe it's Leesburg, maybe it's, it's something that we don't even know. Maybe it's a high speed train. Maybe it's Hyperloop. I, I don't know what what the ultimate solution may be on the back end. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it at that. that. That was actually my life. So, <laughs> to, to, oh. just in closing, the <laughs> <laughs> the future of Dulles is is a however we get there. And I, I, I like where what your comment was about the logistics of it, kind of. That point and that point, I think we've got to sort out. If we've got the barbell handle figured out, can we make can we make Dallas better? Do we make the whole travel experience around DC better? So I got it. Thank you. Yeah, we've got we've got a few minutes for Q and A. Does anybody have questions? I've got a question. And since you're an architect, and I, I, I like to think about this all the time. Ever since I went to the TWA hotel, I think how many rooms and how much money would it take to turn our old tower into a hotel? <laughs> uh, well, the money part, I, I can't yeah. tell you. Yeah. If if there's a desire, and if there's if there's the right ROI. Anything is possible. I, I, I've never done a, a tower hotel that that narrow. Yeah. Just I don't think about it. Sorry. That's better. It's there, there, there. just me. But it, it does beg it, a, an interesting question, though, about when you look at to put Dallas on on the map, kind of what a global airport is. Most of the the real heavyweights in terms of big when you look at Changi. And Incheon, they've got a hotel that is really, really on airport property. I say last night at the Marriott, um, but to get not this Marriott, the other Marriott, but to get there, I for some reason I just had to walk there. So I kind of come up the tunnel, go through the parking garage, and then go around. And it wasn't bad. I could have taken the shuttle, but I wanted to walk. But if that air or if that hotel was half a mile closer, what does that do to the to the paradigm? What's the ROI on that? Is it different? I don't know. Something I'm, I'm just curious. I my wife and I got back from a trip to Japan and when we got to the airport coming home, we had probably about an extra hour built in so our son in law could get back to uh, home for business. I was impressed when we got to the airport, and it reminded me of the old days of Dulles when I could go and eat and then go out to the observation deck. They have a beautiful observation deck 
uh, and, and a lot of restaurant options that are on the um, outside of security, not inside the security. And it was, I'll just use it in my own words, I don't know if they intended this, but it wasn't just an airport for the traveler, but it was an airport for the community, for people to be able to drop off their family members traveling or to be able to visit and just enjoy the airport and have fun watching aircraft coming and, and going. And I'm just curious, Scott, with your experience um, with any other airports, um, is there even any consideration these days about places to go for people who just want to go to the airport who love airplanes? <laughs> um, yeah. Observation day, yeah. That's yes, um, I, I think it, it is a dying breed. I think it, it, I scroll back to Pittsburgh because this was one of the things we heard when we started working with the airport in Pittsburgh that the community, well, one, the community is very, uh, like if I'm going to the airport and I'm a native Pittsburgh, <coughs> inevitably my whole family wants to go with me. They, they don't do a whole lot of taxi cab delivery uh, of passengers, it's more of, well, obviously, Aunt, ba Aunt Betty's gonna drive you to the airport, and Aunt Betty's coming with Uncle John and 10 other people, and well, they're gonna make an afternoon of it. So when we started looking at Pittsburgh, the way that the plan works is the baggage system is down on the lowest level, which has a certain footprint to it. And then as you go up, the program needs started to decrease and come in further, so you get these this is actually up on the roof of the bag or the bag makeup area. So you get these areas that were left over. So we said, well, why wouldn't you just make this into a public garden? And this is all landside. So this is for people who are meter greeters or well wishers who are coming to drop our, or pick their families up. But from here, the concourse that's beyond the, the crotch <laughs> is kind of right behind me and the concourse kind of slides out here but from here you can look over and you see all the aircraft movements and the CEO of the airport is absolutely enamored with the idea of the public again being able to see flights uh, she's looking already to try to program this space to be concerts to be you name it they could be <coughs> this kind of seven acre park that's just on on top of the, one of the rooms of the airport <coughs> So I think it's going to start to come back. I don't know if we're ever going to see a dedicated observation area again, unless there's an airport that is really into kind of the nostalgia of it. I'd love to do it, but we're not seeing a lot of airports clamor for it yet. So I'm um, I'm flying to South Africa, and they won't let me. I'm, I'm going on a business trip, and they won't let me land in Johannesburg until except when it's daylight. So I have to spend ten hours in Doha. So if you research that airport, which I now like a YouTube freak about researching the airport, that whole thing is a complete culture in of itself. People spend a whole day there. I mean, it draws everyone. It's insane. It's like going to airport Disney World. Um, what about something like that? Um, and have you looked into those types of things to create this transition from international to domestic connecting and whatnot? Or where does that come into play in, in, in North America? Yeah, I, it, it's a great question because uh, we get asked that a lot about what other amenities can you add to it. I think it comes down to uh, more of a, a mindset. When, when I And I, I've done that trip uh, when I was going to Australia. We went through Doha and spent about eight hours there. And but that's the market that Qatar Airways, Qatar Airways has. Uh, you fly in and then it holds you captive in the airport. You spend and you do all the, the crazy things that are there. I think it's it's very different if you're American and, or even if you're traveling to the U.S., you're trying to get to one of the major cities right. and not necessarily, you don't want that as part of your journey. You'd rather just figure out a way to get to Los Angeles quicker. And it, I don't know if any U.S. airport has really committed to that idea of a long haul dwell. Well, I don't know if it's a long haul dwell, it's just, it, I mean, it, you're, you're killing time having to go 20 miles to another airport. So, I mean, if it's a capacity issue, it's kind of a compromise, but it's it's like, you know, I don't know. Just, uh, cause we have so much land here at Dulles, it's not even used. I mean, my gosh, we've got so much we can do here. It's, um, 
Wow. It sure, be, sure beats um, JFK. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, and then we, we have to do our wrap-up. If there is any other, you know? Um, why don't we have a simple app that we get off the plane that navigates you to your next gate, or to security that can be changed, where the language can be changed for international speaking languages, um, that you can walk to your gate and we'll direct you just like how we're directing you on driving to point A to point B, but it gives you all the direction and tells you what's coming up. Hey, you need to have your passport out. Um, that makes us smoother and you don't, you don't feel lost and people aren't stressed because already people are so stressed at airports. Right. So like, why don't we do something that's so simple but um, makes it easier for the passengers? Yeah, I, I think it's, there are certain airports that are doing that. I think MY has an app. It's a question of whether it's deployable and you opt into it as yep. part of your, your ticket. Because a lot of times, especially in the US, the airlines have their own individual apps that have you know, that are gonna direct you for, to their services. But in some ways, especially at, at MWA, they're the umbrella that's over top of that, that's controlling all the airlines and all the services. Mm -hmm. So I think if if we had more people opt in to the MWA app, that, that's the platform that it could be done at. It's possible, it just needs, to get done. Thank you, Ty.